Everybody has a story and every story needs to be heard. On this podcast, we are talking with each member of the General Conference Leadership Council. I'm your host, Alyssa Truman, and this is ANN Profiles. Today, I'm here with Gideon Mutero. He is a Vice President for Hope Channel International. Welcome, Gideon. Thank you. I got your last name right? Yeah, you did. No, with with, the, with the, <laughs> the pause between the starting of the podcast and that, I was really making sure I got the You got, got it, right. it right. Where is your name from? From Kenya. Kenya. From the central region of Kenya. Okay, so... I guess we've already started because now I know where you're from. <laughs> so we like to always start this off a little bit with just kind of like, who are your parents? Where are you from? So tell us a little yeah. bit about your background. Sure. Uh, so I grew up in a pastor's family. Uh, my father, the late uh, Pastor James Mutero, was serving as a pastor in Kenya in various regions, in the coast region, in the western region, in the central region. And uh, eventually, he served uh, as a speaker director for the Voice of Prophecy. So I grew up um, in a pastor's family, of course, um, I learned about Adventism in my childhood. So tell us a little bit about your mother. My mother, the late uh, Rachel Mutero, uh, was a Bible instructor. And she um accompanied my father of course uh, in his various postings and she was a great uh, inspiration to the family a uh, woman of great faith uh, who nurtured us and inspired us uh, to love God and to serve him you know it sounds like you had a, a beautiful foundation kind of to build on both right. your parents were active in the church yeah. active it sounds like and sharing their faith right so this is in the beautiful country of Kenya. Yes. So tell us a little bit about Kenya, the, the place where you were raised, because I think, you know, many of our listeners have never traveled to Kenya. I have okay. actually only ever <laughs> landed an airplane in Kenya. I don't think that counts as visiting right. Kenya. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the country and um, the people of Kenya. What is it like? A uh, beautiful country. Um, we lived in uh, a few areas, but that was very early in my childhood, so I may not remember all the areas. Uh, we lived in the coast region, where my father was a pastor. We also lived in the western region. And um, then while I was probably three or four years old, we moved to Nairobi, where he, uh, my father served as a speaker director for the Voice of Prophecy. Uh, so I grew up in that mission compound um, uh, in a place known as Karura, um, just in the outskirts of Nairobi uh, for most of my life. Um, yeah, uh, beautiful country. Uh, you need to visit, not I, just uh, I, you know, the I, airport. I would love to, other than the airport. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm going to have, I have two more quick questions about the country. Now, for those of us who have grown up in countries like America or something like that, you know, you hear about the the wildlife of Africa. Is is it as common to see um, a giraffe or something as it is to see a deer <laughs> in America or something? What is what is the wildlife like there? So I start first uh, by talking about the people, uh, because we have wonderful people who live in this country. And of course, it's a country blessed with a lot of other natural resources, the wildlife, for example. Um, yeah, you, you can find uh, most of uh, what we call the big five. What are uh, the big five? Uh, the elephant, the lion, uh, the cheetah, the rhino, and the buffalo, I believe. Okay. Um, you could find those uh, um, in many parts of... Um, uh, the country, of course, in the game parks where they, you know, they, they, they in preserved uh, areas. Um, so beautiful wildlife, beautiful country, but also beautiful people. <laughs> I, yes. So the other thing is that, you know, many years ago, we're, we're celebrating 150 years of Adventist mission um, here soon. 
Americans went all over the world to proclaim the gospel. And we kind of sometimes think of Africa still as a mission field. And there are actually more, like ratio-wise, more Kenyans that are Seventh-day Adventist to Adventist ratio than there are Americans. Is that correct? Correct. I believe the membership in Kenya uh, within the two unions now, the East Kenya Union and the West Kenya Union, I believe the membership now is about 1.2 million. I believe that's about the same membership uh, as uh, the North American division. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'd like to bring this up because I think that sometimes we have a wrong vision of Africa. We still think of it as and not saying that we shouldn't go there and do stuff, but I'm sure that many of you guys could come over here as you did and help help us. But I'd like to help people realize that the Africa maybe that we thought of is not the Africa that is there. It's a very developed country too. It's very technologically developed. Isn't that accurate? I mean, obviously, uh, there's portions uh, of it. Yeah, instead. yeah. So, first of all, Africa is a continent. Yeah, sorry. I keep saying Africa. It's so true. It's not. It uh, is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Kenya. a continent. And Kenya is, uh, you know, one of the countries. Uh, yes, it is developed. And um, there's lots of uh, potential in terms of talent, in terms of um, uh, contributions that people can make. Uh, we have very gifted people there, very committed. Um, people who are very um, dedicated to serving the Lord. Uh, so there's a lot that um, Kenya could offer. I agree. Yeah. And thank you for the correction, because you're yeah. right. And that is something else that Americans do, is we right. somehow lump the whole continent together. Sure. Kenya. Yeah. Um, I went to Tanzania, and I was overwhelmed by the beauty of the country, the the hearts of the people. and It was, it was probably one of my most favorite experiences that I've had right. was just visiting and just seeing the church and the the country come alive. So this is where you were born and raised. So you were born and raised in Kenya. Tell us a little bit about your early childhood years. Obviously, we know you were raised an Adventist. What was it like being the child of a pastor? Um, we lived in a mission compound. Uh, we went to an Adventist school. Uh, the, we went to the local uh, Seventh-day Adventist church that was located on the compound. So as you can imagine, we were in a very sheltered Adventist it's a bubble. <laughs> <laughs> environment. Yeah, a bubble. And um, uh, that had uh, its advantages. It helped us um, grow um, within that safe environment. Uh, but, um, you know, it took uh, learning more as I grew up to actually internalize um, Adventist doctrines and to make my own um, uh, decision to not just be an Adventist because I'm a pastor's kid, but to be an Adventist because I believe that... Uh, the Lord has a special uh, message for his people for the end times, and I need to be part of that movement. So because you were raised in an Adventist community, um, were you involved in Pathfinders and like all that kind of oh, stuff yes. as well? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> I was very actively involved in Pathfinders, uh, went through all the various classes, uh, Are you a master eventually guide? Eventually became a master guide. Excellent. Yes. So, and and I must say that one of the things that shaped my life was the discipline that we learned in as pathfinders. Um, I still uh, value those uh, aspects of um, discipline that have helped to sh shape me, to make me who I am, and also to shape my career. What was one of your favorite Pathfinder memories? Um, I think reciting Bible verses. I was very good at that. <laughs> I <laughs> could take some of the longer passages. And uh, just the practice and to make sure that I said it right, 
uh, I still keep some of those um, verses, the memory verses to date. And mm. I'm able to recount them to my children and, and, and to use them even when we have family worship. I love that. Yeah. Um, Pathfinder is helping with family worships later on in life. Right. <laughs> so I, I'm a big fan of Pathfinders. I am also a master guide. So Wonderful. Pathfinder shaped Wonderful. my childhood Wonderful. as well. Yeah, yeah. And I've seen how that translates to your daughters. You know, I've had the privilege of working with them. And I see those values in them. So congratulations. That is true. You <laughs> yeah. have, you have, you've actually worked. I have three daughters and right. you've worked with my oldest daughter, Maria, and my second daughter, Riley, this last summer when they were summer uh, interns. So, absolutely. <laughs> um, they have, many people have said yes. they've liked working with you, including my daughters. So, yeah, um, yeah so Pathfinders is something that kind of often shapes who we are. And I think it's, it's one of those things that helps also lay that groundwork for that faith. So you said that at some point you had to kind of make the faith your own. Yes. When in life did that start to happen? So I was actually baptized when I was uh, uh, 12 years old. At that time, I, through Pathfinder uh, uh, classes, I had uh, learned a lot about the Bible. I could explain the fundamental doctrines. I had made a determination to serve God for all my life. And that's something that uh, my parents used to talk to us about. Uh, my mother especially used to remind us that uh, we need to be dedicated, we need to be committed to serving God. Um, and I internalized that and um, I have never looked back. Hmm. So at 12 is when you get baptized and you've decided at 12, I'm going to serve God. Right. You don't know what that looks like yet, yeah. do you? Not What did really. you think you wanted to do at 12? So, um, you know, after that, I went into secondary school and um, in a mission school that was far from home, a boarding school. Which school were you at? Uh, Kamagambo um, Adventist School, um, which... Um, uh, was another experience now away from home. And even though it was an Adventist school, it was now more on, uh, I mean, I was now more on my own in terms of exercising my faith and uh, uh, continuing to grow. And there were cha challenges through that period. Uh, Tell us know, about some of those. Get, getting, sometimes getting into bad company and uh, <laughs> not always doing the things that one is supposed to do. But learning through those mistakes and making a determination to uh, do better and to become um, a more um, committed servant of the Lord. Were there any teachers at this academy that kind of stick out to you? Somebody who kind of helped shape you or helped you stay on the, the, the narrow path, so to speak? Uh, yes, we were blessed with wonderful teachers uh, um, at Kamagambo. Uh, we had uh, some missionaries who uh, were very attentive to just helping us grow in our Christian walk. Uh, we also had um, teachers who were strict, very strict, and helped us uh, learn and understand that life requires uh, rigor, and uh, discipline, and that we needed to be more, um, uh, you know, more focused on not just our studies, but uh, developing a holistic life, uh, attending to our physical um, side of uh, life, our spiritual as well as our mental um, areas and that holistic education that is offered by Adventist education. As I look back now, it helped to shape me and make me who I am today. You know, I think it's such an important, the holistic thing, because it's something we all struggle with. Even even us, yeah. you know, we, we serve and we understand this, yeah. but in today's world, it's so hard because you have the, the push and the pull of work and home and all these things and trying to 
to keep that holistic balance is such a challenge. But when we find that, it seems to help us be more efficient and effective in everything that we do. Uh, absolutely. I believe God uh, requires us to look at life uh, holistically. And once we purpose to develop our physical, spiritual, and mental faculties, as well as uh, being uh, socially uh, well-adjusted, uh, we are better placed to be instruments in God's hand to serve humanity. I I, I love that. And I totally yeah. agree. So what was one of your favorite experiences at Academy? Do you have anything that just stood out like a special memory or? Yeah, I, I enjoyed the, the evening vespers. I enjoyed the singing, the congregational singing of hymns. And I still recall some of those hymns. One of my most favorite one was Faith of Our Fathers. Mm. And being a pastor's kid, it kind of had a special um, meaning to me, uh, faith of my father living still. And even today, You can sing it if you want. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> not a very good singer. But uh, even to date, I'm still inspired by the thought of the faith of our fathers, mm -hmm. the faith of my father. He was not born an Adventist. He had to go through um, challenging life experiences in his Christian walk to eventually make a determination to follow uh, Christ and to dedicate himself to serving him. And I look at that and say, that faith needs to continue living, not just in me, but I need to pass it on to my children and the succeeding generations. You know, I love that one of the things that the Adventist Church talks a lot about is our identity. We right. talk about identity and mission, right. but our identity. And our identity is found when we look back in history often. You know, it's my parents. What did they do? These are the things that kind of form who we are. Right. And as Christians, we also look to our Heavenly Father. Right. And so when our when our when those worlds collide, especially like in your case, where you're father was a pastor so he had this relationship with christ you were able to see both often through him and that's a a beautiful picture so i i'm also a big i love listening to people sing i used to be in choirs i'm finding the older i get i don't think i would ever want to sing just like <laughs> off the cuff but that's okay right. but um i i'm a big fan of hymns as well and especially when the people singing the hymns yes. really believe the hymns you know how you can yeah. sing in church yeah. and we're just singing yeah and then we sing the right, hymns right right and then the words have a meaning and the words become part of your experience as you express uh, yourself in music uh so it's not just the singing but these words kind of um, get into your consciousness and you think about them uh, when you come into certain situations, you remember the words of a certain hymn and they inspire you and lift you up. Amen. That's very true. So you went away to academy. Um, were you there for four years? Yes, for four years. For four years. Yes. How was that at the beginning? I mean, were you very lonely? Because this was, was this your first time being away from your parents? Yes, it was my first time. Um, I was lonely, not very lonely because. Uh, my older brother was a uh, class ahead of me and was already there, so he helped to receive me, and uh, uh, we lived in the same dormitory, so he kind of helped me navigate that, so it wasn't too bad. That's good. Yeah. And you said you had an older brother. Do you have any other siblings? Yes, I, I have uh, five siblings. Um, I have uh, three brothers and two sisters. So we are six of us. Okay. And I'm the fourth born, uh, the fourth okay. uh, son. So four boys um, and then two girls uh, after me. 
Okay. Oh wow. So yeah. you're so you're kind of like the baby when it comes to boys. <laughs> yes, so you're yes, like yes, you're, yes. you're the youngest boy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. My husband tries to tell me he's the youngest child, but I'm like you're not the youngest child, but he was the last boy born. I was like, "Ah, oh, whatever." Right. 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 <laughs> so, when you get done with academy, you're going to have to go on to college, university, wherever it is. Do you kind of know what you want to do at this point um, as you're finishing up these high school years? Are you like, I'm I'm a I'm a numbers <laughs> guy. Like, tell us a little bit about that part of your journey. That's uh, that's interesting. Yes, I, I had a, a clear idea of what I wanted to do. I, um, you know, I, I studied uh, uh, we used to call it then principles of accounts and commerce, and um, during the holidays, sometimes I would uh, visit my older brother who, who used to work in the treasury office of the union, and I kind of uh, was impressed uh, <laughs> about uh, working in that kind of environment. Uh, so first of all, I had decided that I would serve God for the rest of my life. So I was thinking of an area where I could serve. And um, I, I had this impression that probably I could work in the treasury. So once I was done with school, I actually, as we were waiting during the holidays, as we were waiting for the results, I, I walked up to the local field office that was located in the mission compound where we used to live. And... Uh, you know, during the holidays, we were just out with uh, other boys, just playing games, uh, ball games, and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. But this one day, I said, let me just walk up to this office and see uh, whether maybe there's something I could do. <laughs> so <laughs> I walked up there, uh, went to the treasurer's office, and asked him whether there's an area where I could help. And he looked at me and said, uh, young man, what do you think you can do? I said, well, I have a little knowledge about principles of accounts, and I also studied commerce. Maybe there is something that I could do. So uh, he was gracious enough to um, find something for me to do. So he gave me an assignment. Um, I still remember um, uh, what he asked me to do, and he... Uh, he told me, see whether you can do this. And I applied myself to it. Uh, within no time, I had done it and delivered uh, the work to him. And uh, he was quite uh, impressed. And he uh, asked me to, whether I had time to come more often. And so that's how I started working in the treasury. I love this. And it actually explains a lot to me about you yeah. because I know that you encourage having summer interns every summer. Absolutely. And now I understand <laughs> a little bit more why. Yes. Because what I love about what he did was he didn't just say, okay, you can make photocopies. Right. He, he gave you a challenge. Yes. And allowed you the privilege to rise up to the challenge. Correct. And I think we don't often do that with our young people. We either kind of are like, Okay, here, make the photocopies. You yes, know, we want to yeah. give them something safe. It feels yeah. like that they can't mess up. Uh, absolutely. Um, I think he was taking a risk, actually. You know, just a uh, boy out of school and uh, assigning them to do something substantive. Actually, the type of work he assigned me was to um, uh, add up the numbers on a trial balance. It used to be done manually at that time. And so I was going to pick account balances from each account and then add up and balance the trial balance. And that's, um, you know, now it's very easy because uh, the system does the it computer for you does as, it. <laughs> as long as you've uh, entered the uh, information. Uh, but one of the things that impressed him was the fact that I was uh, very diligent in picking the balances correctly so that I could then be able to add it up. And that uh, aspect of being diligent and keen and careful in what one does 
has been uh, helpful to me. And I inspire other people to also um, acquire the same uh, keenness and diligence as they serve. But uh, yes, it's, it's good for us to give uh, the young people in school a chance to express themselves. Um, I, I am who I am because I got that chance. Hmm. So this is the summer between high school and university. Yes. Okay, so you now know this is your calling. <laughs> right. <laughs> so where do you go away to university? So I went uh, to Desta University, uh, but uh, not before I had actually worked for some time and also taken some uh, professional accountancy okay. training. Uh, then went off to college, did a bachelor's uh, of business administration degree. So you did you did some work and yes. um, like certificate kind of stuff before Correct. you went away. What made you decide that path? Uh, so from the time I walked into that office, I think I'd made up my mind that if I got a chance, this is what I want to do. And I've never looked back. So it, it, um, um, it is something that uh, I, I had decided I would want to do. And when I got a chance to do it, I applied myself and put all my effort into doing it. Okay, so you went to Daystar. University. Correct. No, is that an Adventist university? No, it's not an Adventist okay. university, but it is a Christian university. Okay, and where is that located? It's in Nairobi. Okay, so I know that there is a Mrs. Yes. in your life. Yes. Where does she come <laughs> into your story? Yeah, very interesting. So I'm done with college, and even while in college, occasionally they would call me to do some tasks in the uh, local field office. Uh, eventually, once I was done, they offered me a job. Now, which uh, field is this? An uh, position. Um, uh, Central Kenya Field, okay. that later became Central Kenya Conference. Uh, actually, by the time I graduated from college, it was Central Kenya Conference. So they offered me a position to serve as an accountant. And uh, same mission compound where I grew up. So very familiar. You're really not leaving, are you? <laughs> not leaving, very familiar <laughs> environment. And uh, as I was there serving as an accountant, um, my father-in-law um, at the time uh, came to be the principal of the local Adventist school. And he moved into the compound and he was living in a house, uh, two houses down the line from where we lived. Uh, at that time, I was living with my mom. My dad had passed away, so living with my mom. Uh, my other siblings were either at work or in college. Uh, so it's me who was actually more or less uh, living with her. And uh, my wife uh, moved to stay with her dad, who was now the principal of the local Adventist school. And uh, so to walk to or to go to their house, um, the pathway was just in front of our house. So I would see her uh, come in and out. And uh, with time, we got to talk, and uh, as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> what does she do? Um, right now, she works uh, here at the General Conference with Adventist Risk Management as an underwriter, as an insurance underwriter. Uh, but she also is in the business field. Okay. And, yeah. So you guys had a lot to be able to talk and relate to. Yeah. Um, all right. So you work for the Central Kenyan Conference. Correct. And how many years were you there? So um, I was there before, you know, for the period before college. And then after college, I was there for about five years. Okay. Uh, during those five years, uh, I served as an accountant. Then I was a senior accountant. And while I was a senior accountant... Uh, the treasurer at the time um, 
decided that he was leaving for further studies. And um, so in, in 1996, they asked me to be treasurer of uh, Central Kenya Conference. Okay. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's kind of fun that you like, you started off and you like, you knew exactly where you wanted to be. And, and God apparently put it very clearly on your heart what your calling was. Uh, correct. Although I wouldn't say I was thinking that that's how things were going, we're gonna to, work. <laughs> were going to work. I just wanted to serve. And my, my desire was to serve as a steward. I had already learned a lot about uh, stewardship principles and I saw myself as uh, somebody who was uh, walking in partnership with God uh, to serve as his agent in managing his affairs on earth to accomplish his uh, purpose for mankind. I love that so much. Right. Um, it, it's very clear to me that that God gave you the skills, the mentorship, the encouragement that you needed right. because he He had a very particular path. And to me, the most beautiful part was that you were totally willing to go on the path he wanted. And you can see that he's He's leading you there. So you're now the treasurer yes. of the Central Kenyan right. Conference. Right. Where do you go from here? So first of all, I wouldn't say I was ready. I was quite young at the time. I tried to learn leadership in addition to just doing treasury work. Um, uh, you know, there were good mentors. Uh, I remember the union treasurer at the time was a good mentor who kind of uh, helped me understand what was expected of me. Um, so I served in that role uh, for some time. And then uh, after some time, I was invited to uh, serve the East African Union, as they called it at the time. It was the union that covered the entire uh, country of Kenya. And uh, I was asked to serve as an associate treasurer. Now, you brought up an interesting thing there. It, it's not just that you have to understand accounting to be a treasurer. You yeah. also have to understand leadership. Yes. And, you know... I think that sometimes we, we don't think that one through, but right. when you, we bring in younger people, it's they might know all the principles, but you still have to understand how to be a leader. Oh, absolutely. And for me, it was baptism by fire because here I was working with um, the pastors and most of the staff who were the age of my parents. So these were really my parents. And I have to interact with them as a leader. I need to be respectful to them, but I also need to guide them. Um, I remember several situations when some of them would come with uh, certain uh, demands or certain requests that could not be fulfilled. And I had to find the right words uh, to respectfully tell them that we are not able to do that and explain to them why. Um, and some would not understand what's this young boy telling me. He, he, he needs to fulfill my, my, my request or my demands. Um, so that was challenging, but uh, it also helped me grow. One of the things that helped me, though, was in all cases, they could see that I had a desire to serve them. And I believe that's something I would advise uh, upcoming uh, uh, treasurers or people who are uh, working with uh, in the treasury work, but leading uh, that you need to be seen as a servant, as somebody who is uh, uh, keen to assist others. That's really important. How do you cultivate something like that? I believe it comes from my upbringing. I never saw my father or my mother serve as bosses. They were always uh, serving people as servants. Hmm. And 
I think I caught some of that from them and I'm very grateful for the upbringing and the experience that they gave us as we grew up as, as the children. When we talk about being a servant, we're really talking about it's like humility. It's, it's, you may be in charge, right? but I don't have to lord it over you. I yes. can be humble. Yes. And especially, I would consider you still young. Um, when, when we work with people who are older than us, there's a lot we can learn from them. And sometimes it can become challenging if you're, you know, in by rank position, you're over them. Yes. And recognizing we still can learn from them and maintaining that humbleness because we are only here because God placed us here is so valuable and um, something I don't think we necessarily always talk about. Yeah, it is. Um, first of all, is the recognition that when we serve God, we are not serving him, first of all, necessarily because we are the best or that we know we know everything. Very uh, true, because I'm in my position and I don't know everything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you, we need to have a growth mindset, a mindset that recognizes the need to learn. And I consider myself to be an eternal learner. It's been many years now serving in the treasury in various roles, but I'm still learning. There are things that I still struggle with and I need to learn to become better. So we, God has not called people to lord it over others. He's called people to serve others. Yeah. So you went to East Africa Union. Um, did you say that was in Nairobi? Yes, in Nairobi. Uh, so you finally have left this compound. So that I've you left lived this in. compound <laughs> and uh, went into another compound, <laughs> another mission compound, although uh, the... You know, the houses where we lived were in a different compound from the where the union offices were, uh, but still in an Adventist environment. Um, that was um, a call into a wider responsibility. Uh, this union at the time had uh, eight fields and conferences and about nine institutions. It was wow. a huge uh, union, actually was the largest union within that division at the time. So you serve as the associate treasurer for I how many years? I serve as associate treasurer for two years. And uh, um, after two years, they uh, invited me to be a treasurer of the union. Okay. Yeah. So now you're the treasurer out of for all of these conferences and institutions right. and helping provide a lot of that mentorship and guidance that was passed down to you right. to um, conference treasurers and stuff like that. What would you say is probably one of the things you learned the most during your union experience here? Um, actually, there are many things that I learned and we were going through a very difficult time with the, with the union at the time because these fields and conferences were not doing very well financially. Uh, uh, most of the union institutions were also struggling. We needed to implement certain uh, reforms, I would say, in uh, restructuring uh, some of the ways in which they functioned. Some of them were overemployed Others were well established, and uh, there was need to rationalize these uh, um, the operations of these entities so that they could accomplish mission. And that was not easy because uh, you are basically telling people that they need to um, cut back in certain areas. You're telling them that they need to adopt. Uh, uh, more austere measures as far as uh, managing <laughs> resources is concerned. So that was challenging. But um, one of the things I learned was if you explain to people what is the ideal, what needs to be done, 
And if you involve them in finding the solutions, there was no one size fits all for all these organizations. Uh, each area had its unique challenges and required to have its unique solutions. And initially, I did not know that. So we were trying to implement the same things in every area and we were running into difficulties. Uh, the situation improved significantly when we involved the local leaders mm. in identifying solutions and finding ways in which they could resolve these issues, um, you know, in their unique settings. And that's a big lesson that I learned during my experience there. You know, I... I love that because contextualization, making something work where you are at. Correct. I think sometimes we, you know, at the general conference or division or union, we just kind of want to hand down like, here's a program yes. or here, this is, this is a system. Yes. But we don't realize that, yeah, it may have worked in this setting, but it will not work in all of these other dozens of uh, settings. Absolutely. And, and we have to take the time to listen. Yes. And to understand the unique makeup of different areas and and then adapt things to make the mission make sense where we are at. Absolutely. It is a difficult art to learn. And I made many mistakes. I look back and see so many areas where I could have done better. But through the experience, through learning from these mistakes, I would say that it's important to contextualize. And it's even more important to listen to people. Uh, you may think you know from the leadership position, and sometimes leaders fall into that temptation of thinking that they know everything, <laughs> but it always helps to listen. I love that. So listen yes. and then contextualize. Absolutely. All right, so you serve for East Africa Union, yes. right? Okay, I was like trying to right. remember the name of it now. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you served right. um, East Africa Union. How yeah. many years were the, you the treasurer? So I was treasurer for two years. Okay. And uh, at the end of that period, uh, the General Conference had made a decision to uh, restructure the divisions in Africa. Uh, and actually establish a new division. So we were under the Eastern Africa division that was based in uh, Harare, Zimbabwe. And the, uh, and the general conference made a decision to establish a new um, division, uh, the current uh, East Central Africa division that would be based in Nairobi, Kenya. So while I was treasurer of East African Union, uh, the division asked me to be involved in preparing the establishment of the new division. They wanted me to be involved in searching for property where the new division would be located. Uh, they wanted me to be involved in establishing uh, some of the logistics that would be necessary to establish a new division. And so while serving as treasurer of the union, I had that assignment that uh, brought me into the new East Central Africa division uh, in its formative stages. And when the division was organized during the uh, organization uh, division council, I was asked to serve as associate treasurer for the division. So you stay in the same city though? I stay in the same city, but now a uh, different location uh, for the office. Uh, the, the division had some property in another part of the city, and that's where the division was initially located. Okay. So why do we why do we restructure divisions? So I know that's not necessarily <laughs> yeah. life story, but you're very intimately involved in this and I know that Correct. you know there's there's always something new it kind of seems like happening. Yeah. What leads to those kind of decisions? Um I think efficiency for mission uh 
the general conference uh, considered the configuration of the divisions at the time. Uh, we had the Eastern Africa Division and the Afro, uh, I believe they called it uh, um, the one that covered the Western Africa. I think it was Afro uh, mid I, I don't I, know. I, <laughs> I, I don't. I this, don't. <laughs> this could become a game show. No, no, no. Sorry, I remember now. Africa Indian Ocean Division. Africa okay. Indian Ocean Division. That division covered uh, mainly the uh, countries in West Africa and uh, Central Africa, uh, all the French-speaking countries from uh, Central Africa. Okay. So it covered countries from uh, Rwanda, Burundi all the way to, I believe, to Mauritania in the western uh, part okay. of Africa. Uh, I think uh, the General Conference um, realized that it may be more efficient to keep the countries that are geographically closer to each other within the same division. And the work was growing, so it was also not just efficiency of mission, but the work is growing, the membership is growing, the uh, mission needs uh, more uh, efforts, more, more structure. So I think that's, that's the reason why they chose to re, uh, um, restructure, restructure and, yes. realign the division territory. So now we have West Central Africa, East Central Africa, and Southern Africa Indian Ocean. Correct. correct? And then... Uh, Middle East, North Africa Correct. at the top, which is a union mission, not a division. Yes, yes. Um, I'm, I've actually always been very impressed with the work in ECD. Um, even today, we, we've we been, we just had Hope for Africa that yes. took place. And I know that they have this big homecoming event that's going to be happening in 2024. Absolutely. Uh, you all think very big in ECD, it seems like. Was that what it was like when it got started? Uh, yes, it was very vibrant uh, when it's when it started. Um, uh, but first of all, there was the work of organizing the division. It was a new division. The other two divisions remained at the previous headquarters. So the Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division remained with its headquarters in Harare, Zimbabwe. Of course, they later moved uh, to Pretoria, South Africa. The West Central Africa Division remained in uh, uh, Abidjan, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire. The East Central Africa Division needed to start from scratch, scratch. so to say. <laughs> so um, uh, I mentioned earlier that I was involved in uh, looking for a uh, property a location where the division could be established. And we found this land that was right next to Maxwell Adventist Academy. Okay. And... Uh, you know, procured uh, uh, the property and the division was established there. So there was that work that took uh, some time, about two years, to just uh, design the new division headquarters and build the facilities and relocate uh, from the office in, uh, in Nairobi to this location that was uh, in the outskirts of the city. But besides that, um, there was the mission. The church in East Central Africa division is very vibrant. The church in Kenya, where the division is headquartered, is very, very vibrant. So it, it has grown. Uh, there's a lot of energy. You mentioned Hope for Africa. Uh, we as Hope Channel had the privilege of uh, sponsoring and supporting this event. And... Um, you know, there's been a big harvest, many souls being brought Amen. into the kingdom. So, yeah, mission is uh, at the forefront, and uh, there's much more potential for growth. So you served, so you're serving now at the division Correct. as an associate treasurer. Correct. How long do you last as the associate treasurer? Because right now it seems like your trajectory is every two years. <laughs> Well, yeah, interesting. Uh, so I was there for five years. Okay. And uh, during that time, you know, the new division headquarters were established. And, you know, that was one of the uh, main assignments that I was working on to uh, design and build the new division headquarters. 
and uh, they now have that beautiful uh, compound um, and facilities uh, for the division. Um, the division was also growing, uh, and uh, uh, in 2005, after the general conference session of 2005, the treasurer who was elected uh, to be treasurer of East Central Africa Division was not able to move or to take up that role because of a sudden illness. So we had a period of about a year when we didn't have a, a substantive treasurer. So I was the treasurer who was uh, responsible for that period, um, which was, you know, uh, a broader experience. And uh, uh, during that time, I also worked a lot with ADRA uh, helping to set up uh, their new ADRA Africa regional office in Nairobi uh, that was being reestablished after it had been discontinued uh, previously. It was based in South Africa and they had discontinued it for a time and now they were reestablishing it in Nairobi. So I was involved uh, in that exercise. I was also involved with assisting ADRA in uh, a crisis situation that had developed in Burundi and helping um, uh, reestablish the board there and actually served as chair of that board for some time. So I had already been associated with some work with ADRA. And so in 2006, during um, uh, annual council here, they invited me to come and uh, during those meetings they asked me to be vice president for finance for other international oh i did not know this yeah so you started <laughs> off at adra before we ended up okay so i was trying to figure out when you got involved in media ministry but it wasn't adra was actually the first absolutely out here so so i moved here with my family at the beginning of 2007 now you have basically lived your whole life in Kenya. Yes. Before coming to yeah yeah. America. Although while I worked for the division, uh, you know that that division currently has eleven countries. I think at the time there were ten countries. They just got South Sudan uh, mm -hmm. a few years ago. Uh, so while I worked with the division, I served in those countries and um, um, worked a lot with the teams in those countries, the treasurers in those countries. Um, so I, I had already broadened my experience beyond Kenya. Uh, at, beyond at just Kenya. Yeah, right. <laughs> but what would you say was the biggest challenge of moving, especially you said your family, was it, it's your wife, you, were there children? And my two daughters, yes. Okay. Yeah. How old were your daughters when you moved here? Um, so my first daughter, when we moved here was, um, uh, 12, 11 years old. Okay. And my younger daughter was uh, seven years old. Okay. Yeah. So, the, I mean, those are kind of hard years to move across the world. Yes. What would you say the biggest challenges were that you found as a family when you moved to America? Um, different culture. Um, one of the different uh, aspects of culture that uh, we immediately felt was uh, the worship service. We joined Beltsville Church, and uh, we enjoyed the services there. But um, at uh, 12, 15 p.m., uh, church is done. Uh, everybody clears the parking lot, and uh, we have to leave. We're done. <laughs> we're done. We're done. And uh, we were not used to that. We were used to an all-day church where we would go and be at church the whole day. Uh, have potluck at church, have an afternoon program. And so here we are, 12.15 p.m., uh, done with church, going home. Do we change our Sabbath clothes? Uh, what do we do? <laughs> so that was uh, kind of culture shock and a new experience. And uh, we struggled with that a little bit. Hmm. But, but also for the kids, uh, you know, they adjusting to a new school, a uh, new system of education. Um, I, I, they adjusted quite well, uh, as you'd imagine, uh, but uh, that was also challenging. You know, it's 
you know, a lot of people are like, oh, that must be so fun for your kid. It's, it's actually hard on families often with the transitions. Even with us, we just trans transferred from Texas to Maryland. That doesn't seem like a lot. But when you involve children in it, yes, you know, it, if it's just you and your spouse, you can kind of work through things. But right. when we start moving families, I yes. think we forget the the challenges that arise for them and they can adjust to it well. And, but it's still, you're uprooting them from what they know. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and putting them somewhere else. Yeah. And it, apparently we don't do church all day. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, but I must say that, uh, you know, the trans transition uh, ministries here at the general conference was very helpful. Um, we adjusted, uh, but I must say the weather was also very challenging to adjust the to. Weather. <laughs> we came I've, I've here. heard that one a few times from people here. Yeah, we came here during winter and, uh, you know, that that was tough. Uh, you know, we didn't have adequate winter clothes, so we, you know, we had to adjust there. But um, it's all good, I think, when God calls us to certain responsibilities or certain areas like he did with the uh, you know with many people in the old testament he equips us to adjust he enables us to do what he wants us to do so how many years did you serve with adra so i was with adra for four years um and uh, then transitioned to hope channel international and you've been there how long I've been there 12 years now. It's been a great blessing to see Hope Channel International grow. At the time when I joined uh, Hope Channel International, my first responsibility was to establish it as a separate entity uh, with separate books of accounts from the General Conference. Uh, there was already a separate board, but Hope Channel was still functioning as a department of the General Conference. Uh, so we transitioned it to a separate entity an institution of the general conference and i've seen it grow at the time we had just um, a few number of channels i don't remember how many maybe about uh, 20 plus uh, we now have 82 channels uh, part of the global hope channel network i always love <laughs> when i walk into um, hope channel yes and if any of you listeners come we we give tours of the building at 10 o'clock <laughs> um so when we take people to Hope Channel, I always look on Joe Sloan's door. Yes. And he has this like, it would be like That's, 76 yes, and then yes. it's crossed out. There's a 77 <laughs> yeah, so, crossed out. Yeah, it keeps growing. It so keeps yes, growing. I, yeah. I enjoy looking to see what the latest number is every yeah, time I yeah, walk in there. So I, I've, I've loved having this time with you. Thank you so much. Getting, I, I have a, a closing question. Yes. For those young people who have thought about maybe working for the church, but they don't necessarily know how to get started, what to do, or maybe even for somebody who's later in their life, um, but they, they feel called to ministry and they don't know what to do. You had great clarity, it seems like, almost from the very beginning. What advice would you give to those people, though, who don't have that same clarity, but they know that God has called them to something? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I would advise them to do something, even in their local churches. Let them volunteer their time and efforts, their talents, to serve the church. If the Lord calls them to get involved in more substantive ways uh, in uh, serving their local conferences or any other entity, uh, let them heed God's call. Um, it's not without challenges. It's not perfect. But uh, our God is perfect. And he works through our imperfections. I would encourage them to just follow God's leading. And see where he's calling them to serve. Uh, he will enable them to do his will. Um, and help them to overcome the challenges that they encounter along the way. Thank you so much for that, Gideon. And thank you again for taking time out of your day um, to come. I know that we are all busy right. and accountants, there's always something to do. Right. Um, thank you for coming and joining us. Thank you, Alisa. Thank you for having me.
We hope you enjoyed this episode of Anna and Profiles with my special guest, Gideon. If you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast or this YouTube channel, wherever it is you're tuning in from today. We don't want you to miss any future episodes. And thank you for spending this time with us. Join me next week as I continue to get to know the life stories of more inspiring people.